Hi, Rich. Welcome to the podcast. It's an absolute honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to have this conversation today with you. And I'm very, um, yeah, just so happy that you're here. And I just want to ask you before we start everything, uh, do you have a daily practice that is important to you and that you would like to share with us? Um, I've had many daily practices over the, over the years from the, the hardcore Kundalini um, mantras to um, the sun salutations from Hatha Yoga. Um, currently I'm doing Wim Hof, the Wim Hof breath hold um, cycles and the cold showers and things like that. I find very beneficial to how my mind works so yeah that's that's what I'm doing at the moment for my daily practice so there's the breath retention with um hyper oxygenation for 30 to 40 breaths which are very fast <sighs> and then a breath hold with your lungs empty for as long as you can hold it and it's a exercise of seeing how you can tolerate discomfort and then cold showers afterwards again tolerating discomfort building my body's resilience to discomfort and yeah I find it very useful that's very interesting and seems to be so beneficial for so many people and mm. has been proven to to work positively with uh, the body and the immune system and we go back to these ancient teachings of oh, God, yeah. ancient practices again yeah even with the pranayama in the yoke in the yogic cycles it's still these these deep breaths these fast breaths work from any culture and every religion has a breath practice even christianity does but they've stopped doing it now so yeah that was forgotten and yeah in in the yogic tradition that i i'm from is we the it's it always starts with like the fast breathing like kapalabhati mm. and anuloma viloma and those two in combination. So you start with an alternate uh, nostril breathing, and then yeah, and then the kapalabhati. Uh, and yeah. it, it does something with the body, and it's real. It can be very uh, tough in the beginning, but you really start feeling energy. Build. If you do that, I did it for a whole month during my training, and you start experiencing like different things, and yeah, you start feeling like the organs is like enhancing and energy also uh, enhancing. So it's really great. Thank you for sharing that. No, thank you for asking. So I'm really excited uh, now to talk to you because I think it's going to be such a unique uh, episode. Uh, I've done many podcast episodes with different amazing guests and, and authors. And but today we're really going to come into probably the traditions and practice or the the wisdom of where I am in the Nordics and what you're really amazing uh, like you have a long journey within that so maybe for those that are listening that don't know who you are maybe you can start with that and also maybe your path into where you are right now of course um, my name's Rich Rich Lister I'm in the UK um, I started on the heathen pagan type path probably almost 20 years ago now maybe a little over and um when I was at a pagan camp one evening there was a we had a big old fire as you do at a camp in the middle of summer and um what I thought took me 10 seconds was a half an hour of me standing in the middle of the field staring at this fire as this deity came up through the fire and told me to go off and learn the runes and I don't know about you, but when something comes out of the fire that's bigger and scarier than I am, has one eye and a big spear, I do what I'm told. So I spent time learning the runes, um, specifically the Elder Firth Ark, um, as well as um, other modalities like yoga, Ayurveda, um, massage, and all kinds of other fun things that um, accentuate what I'm doing so I can bring that those modalities and tools to the world. And that's kind of a very brief synopsis of what I do. Um, currently, I work with people around where they need help and support in the world because I'm a I'm a, a fixer type of person. If you have a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Um, and yeah, I work with people around 
um, fix helping them solve their problems and move past blockages and stuff like that using very NLP words with the runes and runic divination and things like that to help to bring it all together on a very holistic, all dimensional, all energetic pathways patterning way. That's wonderful. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of like cohesive themes in what you're doing and how you're in service and, and so many like beautiful synergies with what you've learned and what you've practiced and what you're mm. sharing also. And I'm particularly curious, partic particularly curious about the, the um, so you had this amazing experience with uh, a being that mm -hmm. uh, came in and initiated the path with the runes for you. Yes. If you want to tell us more about that, because I don't think many people even might know what the runes are and, and yeah, how you started to like evolve that practice. So the runes are um, a alphabet, except Nor Nordic, Norwegian, Sweden, Icelandic, etc. And it's built on the sounds that people made to speak with back then. So primarily it's an app, runes are an alphabet, it's a means of communication. They were used to write things down like Hafdan was here or this sword belongs to Sven or things like that. Um, they've also, because of how your human mind works, developed stories and patterns that have evolved with the runes to become more than just um, this series of sounds, this alphabet. So we have rune poems from the, like, the seventh century in England and um, sixth century and ninth century in um, Norway, Sweden and Iceland, pardon me, that um, tell of the stories of these um, carving, these lines that people found in rocks or on swords or carved into whale bones and things like that. So there's different poems and energies associated with these runes. So we have the first rune, this looks kind of like an F, it's Feu, and this rune is got associated with the cattle, the cow. And back in like the, um, the fifth century, the cow was literally walking money. So if you had a cow, you could feed yourself because it would give you milk. And it was also worth money because you could sell it. You could, um, if it died, you could use its um, hide and eat its meat. So it's like walking money. So these concepts, while quite primitive, can um, have evolved for about 700 years, 800 years across Northern Europe into a very strong belief system with a pantheon of gods like Thor and Odin and Loki, not necessarily Tom Hiddleston, but it works, it works, um, to as well as the energy and the belief patterns of like the construction of the worlds and where you go, where you die, and all of these sort of things have all evolved in the Northern psyche that stopped at about 1100 when Christianity came across all of Northern Europe. So we have a really evolved spiritual practice of based around runes and this pantheon of Northern gods and goddesses and goddesses keep, I mustn't forget that because they're that, they're a big part of this. And they stopped when the patriarchal Christian monks wanted to record all these stories. So they only wrote down the, the guy stories. All the, all the women's stories were relegated to either not being recorded or just being the Mary Magdalene uh, um, whore or the um, Mother Mary mother figure that we lost all the bits in between. So yeah, we've got this, and it stopped. We've got this um, religion that stopped in like 1100s. And then it starts to come back again in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s as people trying to work out where these stories come from and the belief patterns that come with that. So we've got a very primitive belief pattern by modern standards being applied to modern society, trying to interpret how these runes mean now, because we don't have an Urux, which is the Uraz rune, uh, rune, which is a giant prehistoric cow that walks through the um, moors that can't really be killed by people unless you get a whole village to do it. They've, they've died out so what what's a really big powerful strong thing now is it a jcb digger that pushes earth out the way or a bulldozer so we, we have these ancient analogies coming into this modern world and trying to find a place that we can understand them and they can understand us because 
runes are energy and they want to be used because they're, they're like living pulsing things so yeah these energies are coming into our world now and we are here to utilize them in ways that we understand but if we use them wrong then there's no wrong but if we use them carelessly then we have these energies going off doing funny things or if we use them in ways that are not meant to be used they don't work very well so it's us to interpret and understand how these very primitive um, swedish norwegian icelandic um, british german danish all these different um histories come together to make this energies that we have now if that makes sense yeah that's a great description and background and for me, so when you start talking about the runes, I I start thinking about like when probably we we studied them here in Sweden from a very young age, not studying, of course, studying the history and, and seeing them. But I remember the first time I visited, maybe I was 11 or 12 when we visited uh, a big, it's like a big remainder of a Viking site called Birka. Uh, oh yes. Uh, yeah, it's very close to my hometown. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so we take the boat from my hometown and you get there. And I remember the place was so, uh, I was already in that age, very attuned, I think. I loved the place and to see the runes. I remember it from that, that perspective. And they had, we had this big, um, yeah, just guided tour there. And then I also, in my hometown, uh, we have one of the most like big and famous churches, but all around it, you see runes. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a famous place because the King Gustav Vasa was crowned there. But then you see all these tablets of runes all around it. Mm. It's really special that way. And then now where I am now, also close to a Viking site, uh, seeing it also on how, how also what I've heard from the ar archeologists uh, here, they said also, if I don't remember it incorrectly, the tablets of runes could still be in the center of the church up until a certain time. So it was really important. And then you see these depictions, maybe you know more than me about the, about the mythologies, because one thing that comes up for me is always the snake that is um, like around and- that Yeah, Yongir, the snake, the, the world serpent, yes. Yeah, what is, so j just like these tablets and these images, it's like, telling stories in a way and sometimes yeah it is very mundane like this is this person's it was like some of yes. the peaks are very mundane but we don't really know what what the exactly the purpose is but what is the mythology around because we see the serpent in so many cultures and I'm really fascinated by it personally and then also since coming to this place, which is very much infused with Viking energy, I saw that also the dragons are a big part of, of the mythology as well. Um, hmm. What have you, what, what, can you share a little bit about that? Yes, what so there's a couple of sagas, um, Sigurd's saga, if I remember rightly, where he um, gets too greedy and gets turned into a dragon and has to sit on gold. Um, and there's Jungir, the um, Loki's son, who um, in, encircles Midgard as a giant serpent that when Thor has to go to Midgard Loki, he has to lift the serpent up to prove how strong he is. Um, the, there's the serpent, there's the Woodham that um, in Anglo-Saxon, so this is like um, Christianized um, Scandinavian stuff, pardon me, that is the um, the biggest poison that the Saxons can come up with was Adderweth, so this this poison from the Adder. So that's the most toxic thing they can come with. There's not a lot of poisonous snakes um, up north in the in the world because snakes like warm and they, and they, so they don't um, get much beyond like Germany and things like that, from what I gather. And 
so these um these these wyverns these worms these dragons all are quite mystical beasts in the old um geetish story beowulf beowulf has to fight a dragon to save his um kingdom after he defeats um grendel and it's a uh a cinema metaphor for um, Beowulf's greed and largesse because he's got so fat and lazy the dragon can come in and this dragon has to challenge his manhood his kingliness to be uh, to show that he's worthy of it so this dragon comes in and scares and scares everyone and kills lots of people and Beowulf has to kill him etc there's a whole thing about that and the Sigurd saga as well about how um, the, dra the dragon corrupts so it's all this quite hidden corruption, not good enough stuff around the serpent from what I can see. But then we also see where the bias of those people recording those sagas comes from. And while they could be a metaphor for the, the giants that um, are very primitive um, deities that uh, lived in the land before the gods of war like and, and air like Thor and Odin or the gods of the farming like um, Freya and Frigg and things like that. These very primitive gods, these hunter-gatherer gods were called Jotun and they were very primitive. They, had, they were gods of lightning and fire. So these dragons could have come out of those. But if, they, if the stories are being written down by Christian monks, because the stories weren't terribly written down by the Scandinavian people, because it takes ages to carve a story in rock, where actually if you're writing it in quill and ink, you can do it quite fast. So that perhaps it went through their lens of the serpent is evil, serpent, female, same thing in the in that in that mindset. Um, therefore, the serpent becomes evil. The evil is dragons. Dragons is evil. Women are evil. Blah 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 blah. Push push that agenda forward. So it could be that those that agenda has been pushed onto these Scandinavian myths that the dragon is an evil thing. Where actually Jungir holds the earth together and stops everyone falling off the edge. Um, Sigurd becomes a dragon to look after his wealth to, to, keep, to keep his people safe and Beowulf is challenged by the dragon to make sure he doesn't get complacent so I think there's a very interesting um, meeting of two cultures between the, the um, evolved quote unquote Christian dragon that St George slew um, that tempted um, it, um, Eve in the Garden of Eden to the um, almost noble, I'm going to challenge you, dragon that come from the northern cultures, the Wirum. So I think there's a meeting of there in the stories that we have that we have now. Mm, yeah, that's very interesting. And like you said, the the because in so many cultures, like the so if you look in ancient Mesopotamia, like the the snake is the the symbol of wisdom and is actually like the good uh, god that wants to bring us knowledge mm. and then the one yeah it's like a little bit mixed up uh, and we started to fear uh, this symbol but it's actually really powerful symbol of also the divine feminine and Definitely. like you said so what i've learned from these archaeology ar archaeologists that have guided tours here in in where this viking site where i'm very close to they also said like the um to scare people uh of the the viking traditions they said that the vikings performed asa blut which is um a kind of a sacrifice ceremony mm. and it, it should have been very barbarical and like hanging uh, like animals but now that they look at the archaeology it's not true because they see that I don't know what it was with the remaining of the of the animals it it it's probably not that type of, of like sacrifice as as the Christians made it out to be and also an interesting thing is that even for a long time this this very ancient city which was here and this uh, very special mounds that we have, whereas the biggest mound is actually uh, like a feminine one. It was mm. said that it was a woman 
that was uh, that was buried there. There's many of them. There's so yes. many like spread out. But and she had horses and and wands and magic bees and things, didn't she? Yeah, probably. I heard like a snippet of, of about this, and and they said that. Um, yeah, like the story, this place is so special that even the, when the church started to slowly take over, they came there to be in this special place because mm. they knew how sacred this place was from the beginning. And the church that is still there from probably the ancient temple. So it's really interesting. Um, but I'm also very, very curious about the, the now that you're working with runes. You're working with them in a specific way. So we even here in Sweden, like we can in there's people that engrave the runes as an as a like you set your energy into like yes. something. And that's what you also do, right? And how and then you also use that as a divination. So yeah, um I think that there's no or very minimal evidence if we're talking archaeologically around runes being used for divination however it works really well and from what i do know of the ancient scandinavian people they're really good at making use of what works really well um and so i work with runes to divine the path forward to map the way forwards to like track the energies of the weird and the weirds this northern concept of all of the fates of everything on the planet entwine together and you follow yours and you interact with things and ours our weird right now is together because we're talking um and tomorrow our weirds will be in somewhere else because we'll be in different places and i've gone down downstairs in a bit and my wife's downstairs so our weirds will be together it's all the energies that pull on your thread of life is the weird and the runes, I believe, drip into that weird and almost like a magnet attach themselves to certain threads. So if you have an abundance thread of your weird, then the Feyu rune might be present when you pull it from the bag of runes. Um, or if you have a, a big change coming up, the Hagalaz rune may appear from your foot. So the runes are attracted to what the re energy resonance is around you at the time of the pulling of the runes from the bag if i'm speaking clearly there and i believe that by doing that and if you have the will to sort through the confusion of many weirds ahead of you then you can have a look and see what energies are present for you the reader or whoever you're reading for can will be able to face or be facing and experiencing in the future. And I think these were done before um, big trips, um, because if you're taking a 80 foot um, oil powered boat across the North Sea in summer or winter, it's gonna be quite a journey, no matter what, what weather it is. So you want to know what you can expect, what when you can make landfall, how much water do I bring, et cetera. So I think the Volva, the um, witch of the village, would have pulled runes to set the people's minds at ease about what would be going, what would be happening going forward. So you can plan and adapt and um, track the energies moving forward so you can make decisions and become the most powerful person you can be in that situ situation. And that holds true now. The Volva is a feminine term. It's, it's the, basically the, the, the old Norse for witch. and um, I think the magic lay lay lies with the feminine in Scandinavian culture. Men were in charge of everything outside the house. Women were in charge of everything inside the house. And so all the magic, all the money, all the resources were the female purview. Guys got to farm and lift heavy things and um, have swords if you're lucky. And so different energies there about how we um, interact with the rooms. And because we come from a very patriarchal standing over the last few hundred years all that knowledge was passed into masculine hands and literally burned out of feminine and that's why i've got it now and i really want to pass it on so that's yeah that's why i'm here mm, that's amazing and i love that yeah so also like the um, when you're weaving uh like what you said is 
it's like you you have these strings which make this web of life and mm. um, that's also in the mythology right with i think it's nur nuna who has the like the the fates i think Nur-Nuna. yes they live at the bottom of the yggdrasil the world tree yeah and they spin the fates together into thread so yeah. families will be spun together or friends will be spun together and these threads would intermerge and then come apart etc yeah i was in um so there are some um now uh, swedish women who are embracing this uh, old traditions because since it is still like indigenous to here mm. there has been stories passed on and and um, we did a meditations with the three nur nur because we also worked with these these energies and völvuna uh, the völvas they um what i learned was that they were healers that would uh, go from town to town as well and and the healing modality besides like connecting with something spirit and divine from like channeling also surrounding a person who's sick and singing and singing intentions uh into yes. this person and th- then you think about like mantras and and all of this which is a part of like most traditions how uh, singing and using the voice and intention really can heal someone and then affirming also yes definitely you're being healed you're being healed like because mm. um my um, anglicized version of that is galda mm. Mm. um and it's that sung magic yeah and we see it in especially yogic traditions where you're um you're doing for instance your gayatri mantra your mba bhasvaha Mm. calling on the divine spirit of, mm. of she to come down the feminine and if you're singing magic into someone as one person as one voice that's great but if you have all the women all the sisters of the village together singing together of 20 30 50 people not only do you heal the person who's hearing the song and it's directed at every person in that circle heals and then you add um the kids, the children, the husbands and sons, etc., all around adding their voice to a thing. It's a massively powerful um, humanizing event to sing and chant together because it brings everyone's breath into alignment because we're all breathing at the same time on a very base neurological pattern. And when we do that, we build oxytocin in our bodies. We That attraction hormone comes up so everyone feels closer to each other and we're bringing the um, energy from the song into people and we're bringing that collective goodwill and we're bringing the the magic teas that someone's grandma made and the magic um moss that someone found on the hill with them when they were sheep herding all of these things come in to help heal not just through the very esoteric model of energy cham- channeling or bind runes or runic staves but the the vulva, the kuninga, the, the wise woman brings all of this together as community to heal someone, not in isolation. Yeah, it's so beautiful, exactly. And and this, this form of shamanism, like said, um, it is very feminine. And uh, mm-hmm. I think that's very interesting because it's it's kind of like most like, uh, traditions here here in Europe um, and many other places where the 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 women were healing and and uh, and the seed was like to like it is a form of shamanism because it is a, uh, they used to go into a trance state to yeah. uh, to give messages uh, to people and. Um, and now somehow, like you said, like there is somehow these traditions are being woken up because I think also imagine when you uh, your your people get colonized by um, uh, by a, a religion, and mm-hmm. then also we have villages like there is particular um, places and also 
just one that I know in Stockholm where people were executed uh, because they were practicing their own uh, traditions. And then having that fear for so long, probably, and then because I always think why, why it's so secularized here to a point where like everything that has to do with spirituality is almost like frowned upon uh, yeah. because we're so modern here. But then it's also, I think it's like an inner spiritual wound that once you have not been able to anymore practice what your foremothers have practiced, and then you adopt something, but then it's not truly integrated maybe, and you're, you're doing it out of fear. And then a counter reaction to that would be to discard everything. So I think I, I agree. I think um, when the I didn't frame it as colonization, but it's this it's the right word. When colonization of Christianity moved across Europe, mm. um, they acted in ways that they thought was the right thing to do. This was what um, three ninety they landed in. Um, in Dover from Gaul um, and bringing that stuff with them then. Um, and St Cuthbert in um, Ireland and Scotland was what, 650? So this is, this is like 1500, 1600 years ago. Um, and this integration of Christianity um, didn't happen quickly. It happened by building their churches on um, pagan sites. It happened by adopting um, gods and goddesses into the pantheon of the church, which is great because you have now St. Knut and St. Olaf are um, Odin and Thor in, in Scandinavia, in Christianity, in Scandinavia. Um, we have this um, complete destruction of any feminine line of magic that happened with the witch burnings, and especially during the um, Teutonic um, Crusades in what, 1250? when um, the Christian crusaders literally burnt anyone who was pagan in Northern Europe. And all of this leaves a European collective um, anguish because we don't have our own indigenous patterning because we destroyed it quite deliberately and very efficiently, we did it really well. Um, and leaving a very, very small amount of um, things left over. And which is why I believe a lot of European people are desperately searching for spirituality that's things to them a little bit more strongly than the spirituality offered by the Christian church, because that's been very formalized and indoctrinated over the last 2000 years. And that's why we have lots of European people searching in Asia, in India, in, in, from the indigenous people in um, Americas, in Australia because people work the same way roughly. And if we can see that, for instance, a smoke ceremony from um, Native Americans has a essence of burning white sage to clear energies. We have the word in English of reek, which translates to sm smelling bad now, but 700 years ago, it meant to make, pure, make holy, make pure. And we did it with mugwort and we did it with moss. So, um, the branding department of um, the church who's trying to colonize, turn the word reek from a holy noise sound to a bad smell. So we see how these things have evolved. And we have, then we have a human population that's followed the um, scriptures for a long time, but then some, all of a sudden, post-World War I, we realize that that hasn't worked. And we're looking for something more and deeper that resonates a bit more with um, who we feel we are in this world. And we start to evolve into people who are searching for spirituality in any which way it comes. And that's, that's why uh, we constructed religions and spiritual paths like the um, Scandinavian heathenism or uh, Nordic animism, which, uh, which I'm quite a fan of. Um, or people, lots of people going to find um, yoga, Ayurveda, etc as we evolve as humans trying to find the spiritual path that we need mm. does that make sense yeah it makes total sense because also when we see that there is a longing here for like the shamanism that we can find in other countries in the southern uh, hemisphere mm. and then 
I mean, we have living, um, breathing traditions here of that because the Sami people have oh yes the Sami traditions still and yeah and they they are indigenous and they're practicing their own and following the the wheel their own wheel of, of yeah. nature and the year so we have you heard the yolk sorry have you heard the yolk yeah the song yeah and we talk about Galdo a minute ago it's the same it's that sung magic yeah it's yeah definitely this is we have now we have very strong since we are a very like small country we're not not like in in mass but in people we're very small and um, there is clearly a like a remembrance coming in mm. now and people are reviving these traditions and yoika has become also uh, more like more available to people to try because that's also very powerful Mm. And then there is like really power, just as in England, we have like these places that are very powerful and you can see like, you can feel the energy in this, these places that are still there. And um, it's really interesting also when it comes to like the suppression of the feminine, because so what I learned from, from working with these elders is that also like at, um, the stories of Freya, uh, which we which we know now and we think it comes from the viking time it predates that mm -hmm. further further back and and it's not like what we think just as we've portrayed like the goddess as love and abundance but it's really a strong uh, fierce uh, feminine mm -hmm. and then a, an important one i think because we always think about freya when we think just as venus it can be very like similar but also something that's important in uh, our uh, traditions is hell, which is so interesting when you when you think about hell, hell. Yeah. Uh, in Swedish, hell means whole, and she is the dark goddess, and how important yeah. that integration is, and she has these two sides, but it's all been like demonized, and uh, of course the feminine in general. Has mm -hmm. been. Yes, we um, we definitely see the um, polarity. You're either the mother or the whore with female deities. And, yeah, as we de dig deeper into the energies of someone like Freya, she's, yeah, she's beautiful, she's powerful, she's a witch, she has her cats, and she's the mother of the house and etc. But also she gets to choose the dead first before Odin. So she's a badass too, people. Don't forget that. And she has a spear, and she can turn into a falcon, and she has sex with dwarfs to have to make her pretty necklace. She does her, she does all her stuff. Thank you very much. She's got it covered, and I tolerate him because he's off wandering around the world doing his own thing. There's this whole th set of stories that are missing in the Scandinavian mythology because they weren't written down. Because why would you write girl stories down? Girls suck. Blah, blah, blah. And, they, and the monks wrote it, didn't understand women. They only knew nuns and nuns were there for service. So it's a whole different mindset we have to work our way through. Going back to a point you said earlier about the, the power points on the planet. If you look at lots of European places that have been settled by Christianity for the last thousand plus years, we see that churches are built on places of power. Like Glastonbury Tor, there's this big old lump of um sticky outiness in the middle of the flat fens flat um levels with a church on top so there's this big power portal almost like a clitoris with a church on top turning it into a phallus we look at places like st paul's cathedral in london built on a t an isis temple we look at all of these big churches that are around europe they're all built on power points that are that predate Christianity because they knew what they're doing. There's power here. We'll have it. Thank you very much. And to a certain extent, you see it in America as well, because the, when the um, settlers went over to the Americas, they built their churches on PowerPoints. It's not, but, but America spread really quickly. So now we have weird things like giant balls of string on PowerPoints, not necessarily churches. So it's, it's an interesting dichotomy in, in the US, but in Europe, you can really see it quite clearly. 
especially really old churches, are built on PowerPoints. So if you go to somewhere like um, Malta or Sardinia or these little, little Mediterranean islands, they're covered in churches because there's so much power there. It's this creative bowl of human existence. So yeah, I think the, um, there's the PowerPoints, if you find a Christian church in Europe, you'll probably find a, a pagan PowerPoint underneath it somewhere. And the stories of feminine magic and badass goddesses have been forgotten by the historians because they didn't they weren't interested in writing them down in the first place yeah that's very true and interesting yeah because i've been to glastonbury and some of these places and just recently i saw people mapping like the ley lines here as well and there is these there's one specific that i listened to a couple of years ago uh, a woman here in sweden who's mapped out uh, and and since she's clairvoyant and she they're also measuring the energy that comes out from the church actually it mm. can be from the altar like 100 meters out of en power energy so if you are very sensitive of course going in there you you will feel uh, some type of higher frequency i think most mm. of us definitely do and that's why i think it's really beautiful i i'm always drawn to churches when i go to places or any temple like depending on where i which country and and uh, religious context it is uh, i i really love walking into those places the energy is so different and then i think everywhere you find a black madonna in christian churches is somewhere where you think, oh, there's, there's some good shit going on down here. Mm -hmm. There's some good stuff yeah. here. Yeah. When, there's, when there's a Black Madonna, yes, we can go there. Yeah. I think the, the experience with the Black Madonna is so, it, yeah, it is something special. We, and it's so mysterious. We have no idea like where this came from and, and mm. how it's evolved. But it, I really agree with that. I think that's really beautiful. And um, I'm thinking also, about so so maybe you would also like to share of course you've you've written a book about the runes and oh yes you, that's really important yeah let let us see because i'm listening to it it work oh what yeah funny thing yeah, yeah it's ish kind of maybe scary, but you yeah. can tell us yeah now we see it it's called, um, it's called runes made easy um it's out now um it's about how you can develop your own patterns and pathways into reading the runes because I believe everyone has the ability to do it because why would we have the ability to read them if we didn't have the ability to read them in every which way and it tells you what the runes mean that there's a big chunk on what the runes mean my version of what the runes mean but with definitely with the invitation and implied meaning that you discover your meaning of the runes as well and then how to make your own rune sets and how to do readings and pulling runes for yourself and your friends and your family. And yeah, I'm really proud of it. Runes made easy. Get it yeah. where bookshops are. It's it's so good. And also the just listening to the audiobook has been great because then you have your energy there. But also I think in the book form, it's good to go back if you really want to practice with it and to see and, and to really connect with the energy of the runes. I think it's amazing and something that we all needed. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been great to have the resource actually. Thank you. Definitely. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I have a million other questions, but maybe it should be good to have that on a, on a different episode because of I course think I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I, I'm, I'm good at questions. Yeah, and I, I, I just loved everything you shared and, and you have so much insight and how, if people want to work with you, uh, do you do that one-to-one -one or in group? Yes, I offer um, guidance sessions um, with, I use a, a, a map of the soul built around 17 parts of the souls to help, get, help you get guidance into how your world is structured right now and how you can move forward. That's um, a bit of divination, a bit of insight and a bit of good old fashioned NLP coaching all thrown into the mix together to 
um, help you achieve what you want to achieve with where you are and work through whatever's in your own way. I do, I make um, bind rune necklaces out of bog oak. This is 5,000 years old bog oak. Mm -hmm. Yours is coming to you when we see you this, this week. Um, and these are great energy suckers, kind of like obsidian, mm -hmm. but with your own bind rune put into it. So it's like very much yours opposed to a generic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they they um, are quite popular. And I also make um, or do a, um, it's like kind of like a natal chart in astrology, except with runes. There's a runic astrology structure around um, your birth date. And so there's four runes that associate with when, when you're born and it brings those energies into you. And knowing what those energies are helps you make decisions about how you approach the world as well. Mm. So, yeah, I, I do those. And you can find all of those things on www.richardlister.com or at UK on um, Facebook and Instagram. Yep. I haven't worked out TikTok yet. I can't get my head around it. I think I'm 20 years too old so yeah that's how you find me richardlister.com yeah i will share th those links in the show notes here for people to find you and i really recommend uh, them checking out the book of course and uh, yeah if if anyone has any questions it's beautiful and it, it actually is the aurora in the is it the the aurora in the back yes ah yeah. uh, it's so beautiful it, it is infused with the energy of the north definitely yeah if anyone has questions you can connect probably with rich and uh, to just yeah all the links are in the show notes and i really want to thank you so much thank you it's it, an absolute honor it's been so great talking to you as usual and yeah can't wait to have you back here to talk more definitely <laughs> it's gonna be my, my absolute honor thank you thank you